So tonight we're looking at the mark of the beast. But before we get into the study, let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we have again tonight to be able to study your word. We are so grateful the power is on. We thank you that heaven's power never goes off. That tonight your angels are with us and you have promised the Holy Spirit to all of us. So we ask you please to send your spirit to each one of us in our homes, wherever we are. Some of us traveling the berg, wherever we are, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts now and that you'll give us wisdom and understanding as we uh, study this important topic. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as we look at the mark of the beast, um, this is a subject many people all over the world want to know about. And it's an important subject. And that's why it's the book of Revelation. In fact, um, this is a life and death situation. Because as we look into our study tonight, we see that uh, the most fearful, awesome, shocking language in the book of Revelation is actually used in speaking of the mark of the beast. Uh, to read how God describes the punishment for those who receive the mark of the beast is enough to immediately put a sober look on any person's face. And so as we look at this mystical mark of the beast, um, how does one avoid it? Um, that's a very important question. Uh, how does one get it? How many of you think that's an important question? Uh, it's important to know about this truth because those who receive the mark of the beast, we can discover this. There's three definite things that Revelation points out uh, 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 of the specificity of the mark of the beast. Number one, any person who receives the mark of the beast is lost. And in fact, in Revelation chapter 15, we see and into Revelation 16, the plagues fall upon those of the mark of the beast in the time of trouble. Uh, by the way, there are at least 10 contrasts in the book of Revelation with the dragon and the lamb, God's sign and the mark of the beast, the harvest of wheat and the harvest of grapes, Revelation 14, as the lost and the saved, the two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon, also represented by two women, um, the, the true woman that we studied last week, and the false woman in Revelation 17 that gives the mark in Revelation 13. There's two types of people, the saints and the wicked, two spirits, the Holy Spirit and spirits of demons um, under the sixth plague there in Revelation 16. Uh, two types of miracles, false that deceive and true that save. And there's two times of trouble, the little time and the big time. The, 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 the time of trouble such as never was before or the big time of trouble is when the seven last plagues are poured out in Revelation 16. But just before that, there's a little time of trouble when persecution begins to heat up. Uh, two women, the true woman and the harlot woman, and two types of worship, true worship and false worship. And so we can discover tonight the mark of the beast has a lot to do about worship. In fact, that is the central issue as we consider the mark of the beast. God teaches in Revelation that all people on this earth are rapidly dividing into two groups. One group following the God of heaven and the other following Satan or the dragon. Who is represented by the beast? We're going to discover exactly who the beast is. And if we know who the beast is, we will discover what the mark of the beast is. There is going to be those who follow the lamb and receive his sign or seal. Um, those people we studied in lesson number 10. Go back to lesson number 10, study number 10, um, just to refresh yourself there. And then, of course, there's those who follow Satan who works through the beast power and gives the mark of the beast. And so what is the mark of the beast? We're going to discover that tonight. And this is a life-changing message because it's a life and death message because those who receive the mark of the beast are going to be lost. And so it's important that we clearly understand what constitutes the mark of the beast so that we can avoid it. But of course, most importantly, we need to have the seal of God. And so the central issue regarding the mark of the beast will be over worship. And if you read through Revelation 13, we can't do an exegesis of all the texts, but you'll discover that the central issue is about worship, worship, whom you'll worship, how will you worship, and even on what particular day. And so here is the issue here. The pure woman, we studied her last week, uh, represents the pure church, and the false woman that will give the mark also named Babylon and the beast, she is going to deceive the whole world. Of course, only those who don't have the seal of God. And sadly, they will be in the majority. 
The Bible is very clearly, is very clear. And you can see from all the stories in the Bible, beginning from the first destruction of the flood, there was only eight people saved out of the millions that were on the planet at that time. If you go to, for example, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, many, many people were destroyed and only three people come out of there alive. Well, there was four, one dies just outside looking back, Mrs. Lot. So only Lot and his two daughters come out. The whole city was destroyed. And uh, Jesus said, uh, broad is the way that leads to eternal destruction and many will be found therein. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few will be found. And I believe that we who are on tonight want to be amongst that few. Now, when we say few, there will be many people in heaven. We studied that uh, when we looked at uh, heaven itself. But compared to those who are lost, they will be in the minority. But the important thing is this here. Only a third of the angels rebelled with Lucifer. So when you look at heaven, that's on our side, the saved, we are in the majority. And so to understand the mark of the beast, I'm going to go through a very quick study on Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 that reveals the mark of the beast are twin chapters, even though they're written about almost 700 years apart. And so it's very important. So I'm going to go very quickly through this year. And so I'm going a little bit fast, forgive me, uh, but I want us to catch up so we go into Revelation 13. Uh, but but the background to understand these, this chapter is definitely found in Daniel. But Daniel begins in Daniel chapter 2, first of all, God gives Daniel a vision of, of a metal image. And this metal image has got four different metals, um, the head of gold, the chest and arm of silver, the belly and thigh of bronze, the legs of iron, and then you've got the feet of partly iron and potter's clay. And so Daniel um, was shown by God this vision because the king couldn't remember the dream. And you can, you can read that chapter in your own time. Um, but, but the dream had great import uh, about what would take place upon King Nebuchadnezzar, his kingdom, and the subsequent three other kingdoms that would follow Babylon. And so chapter two of Daniel uh, reveals through God's prophet, Daniel, that the head of gold was representative of Babylon, the Babylonian empire, and uh, the chest and arms of silver was representative of the Persian, the Medes and the Persians got together as a coalition to bring down Babylon. And so the Medes and the Persians succeeded Babylon, but Persia was the more dominant of the two powers. Um, and, and so they uh, took over really. Greece conquered Persia through Alexander the Great. And then of course came the iron monarchy of Rome represented by the iron legs. And by the way, the legs are the longest part of the body and Rome rules much more longer than all the other kingdoms. Uh, almost over 600 years. But we find when we come to Daniel 7 now, we have the same vision, but different symbols to depict the same powers. And more information. So Daniel and the book of Revelation are written on a repeat and large. So in Daniel chapter 2, um, we don't have, for example, the little horn that we're going to see in Daniel chapter 7. So there's a lot more information that God gives and... Um, we're going to see now uh, exactly how this fits in in Revelation chapter 13. So Daniel 7 uh, says, uh, I saw in my vision by night. So this is Daniel seeing this vision here. And behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up on the great sea. Now remember what the sea is, right? We studied that in Revelation 17, 15. The sea represents peoples, mountains, languages, and people. So here's four beasts. We'll discover what the beasts are. Um, so they're coming out of the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So they're depicted by different ferocious wild beasts. And so let's see what it says here. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. So you picture this uh, beast here. Of course, this is not no uh, description of a beast that is alive or that we know of because there's no lions with wings. But Babylon was represented by the lion of wings. And I have been there and I've taken pictures by um, carvings and uh, plaques where lions with eagle's wings were depicted in the kingdom of Babylon. Well, what are the next beasts? And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, right? So now from a lion, we go to the bear. And just think about wings, how quickly uh, a ferocious beast can de devour and destroy other countries and dominate them when they have wings. Just as the military uh, powers today, uh, if you 
you don't have an Air Force, well, you know what, you're going to be in the lesser. Those of the Air Force have that ability to fly and bomb. Well, it was raised this bay on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its three teeth, rather. Those three ribs represent the three powers that it conquered to rise to power. It was um, the country of Babylon, of course, and then Lydia and um, another country, right? Daniel 7 verses uh, 4, it says, after I looked and there was another leopard, right? So here's the third beast, a leopard. Notice this leopard, it had on its back four wings of a bird. So if you think two wings are fast, imagine four wings. How quick would this power conquer? We can discover what that power was. Then we come to the fourth beast. After I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, and it had huge iron teeth. So this is a, a nondescript beast. In other words, um, the others we know about lions, bears, and leopards, but this one is just a terrible, ferocious beast. It's got uh, strong iron teeth. Very, very similar to another metal that was used in Daniel chapter 2. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. So here's a beast with 10 horns. So it's a ferocious beast, it's a dreadful beast, it's a strong beast, and it's got 10 horns and strong iron teeth. Well, what does a beast represent in prophecy? So we're coming to understand what a beast means. Now, when the Bible uses a symbol for a beast, it's not in any way trying to be derogatory or insulting of the nation, because even today, many nations use animals as symbols to represent themselves. For example, America uses the eagle and Russia uses the bear. China uses the dragon. And so countries today use beasts to symbolize what they are. And then and they even put them on the flags. But but this is now what the Bible tells us what a beast is in prophecy. Those great beasts which are four, and what's the next word? Are four kings which arise out of the earth. So Daniel sees them coming out of the sea, and we find the symbol for the sea in Bible prophecy is definitely multitudes, languages, nations, and people. But here the symbol is interpreted here by Daniel. He says, listen, these beasts are actually four kings or four kingdoms which arise out of the earth. And so the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So it, it represents a king, but it also re represents a kingdom. So here's the fourth beast, a fourth kingdom of the earth. So the beast comes out of the sea. In prophecy, a sea represents, like we said in Revelation 17, 15, waters, which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So when the beast comes out of a densely populated area, it's used, the sea is used, right? So let's look at these very quickly. The first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. Daniel says, I watched and until the wings were plucked off and it was lifted up on the earth. A man's heart was given. This represents its king, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a very proud guy. And actually, Jeremiah represents that this nation, Babylon, was to be represented as a lion. A lion has come out of his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on its way. So Nebuchadnezzar, the proud, arrogant king of Babylon, he was the first king of this conquering power and it was a mighty power. And so in Daniel 2, it's represented by the head of gold, but in Daniel chapter 7, it's represented by this lion with eagle's wings. And like I said, many, many lions with eagle wings were depicted on the walls of Babylon and in many museums today. And so the second one, which is the bear now, what was this bear? It was raised up on one side and three ribs in its mouth and between its teeth. So it's raised up on one side that represents the more dominant of the two powers. So you've got two shoulders. The one side is higher. There was the Persians. The Medes were the weaker. And it had to devour three kingdoms to be able to rise up to power. And so Medo-Persia, of course, rules from 539 BC to 331 BC because Babylon ruled from 605 BC to 539 BC. So it's very important to understand this. After this comes this other kingdom here now of the, the Persians is the bear. Uh, I mean, from the bear, we come the leopard. After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on his back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads. So four wings, four heads. And dominion or power was given unto it. Well, four kingdoms would arise out of that one nation. So in other words, when that nation would come to, the, 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 the head of that nation would come to the end, four would take its place. Well, this was none other than Alexander the Great, who was the greatest king of the nation of Greece. And in fact, in Daniel chapter 8, we have more information. It actually names the country, Greece, and its first king, its notable king, Alexander. Well, 
When Alexander came to the end of his life, just at the age of 33 years old, he died in Babylon, by the way, in a drunken stupor. After he had conquered all the powers that he could, he was just like so bored with himself. And um, he could conquer nation, but he could he couldn't eat him. And so he died of an overdose of alcohol. Now, when he died, his son was too young to rule. And so they asked him when, while he was on his deathbed, seeing the time was near for him to die. You know, Alexander, who is going to take over from you? He says, well, the strongest will take over. So he had four generals. And um, history tells us that each one waited the sword against the other and the empire went down in a strife. And so these four generals, of course, they were Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And so we find that they became, uh, the, the, they, they split it up in the end. The whole territory was divided between the four. So June 22, 168 BC, at the Battle of Perdina perished the empire of Alexander the Great. And so you can see the four eagles um, the four-headed uh, beast leopard with the four wings represented the speed at which Alexander conquered uh, the nations that stood in his path. And so Greece is represented by this power from 331 BC. They conquered, of course, first of all, the Persian Empire, and they ruled up in 168 BC. The next is this ferocious, dreadful beast now. Ah, Daniel really wanted to know much about this beast here because it had to do a lot with God's people and end-time prophecy. Then he says in Daniel 7, verse 7, After this, I saw a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth and it had ten horns. So what's uh, synonymous with Daniel 7 of this beast and Daniel 2 of the four metal image? The legs of iron, right? So this beast has got iron teeth. So you can see it's even depicted by the same metals. And so Rome rules from 168 BC to 476 AD. This is the power that ruled in the time of Christ. Pontius Pilate, who um, sanctioned the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, of course, was a Roman governor. And so Rome, the iron monarchy of Rome, rules for the longest, more than 600 years. So Daniel now says, I was considering the horns that came up after this fourth kingdom, which was Rome. There was, of course, Rome was divided uh, and not conquered from another. It was divided into 10, 10 kingdoms. Uh, I was considering the horns and there was another horn a little one coming up among the ten, right? Before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So what is a horn in Bible prophecy? That's very important. What do these horns represent? Again, we don't have to guess. The Bible tells us, Daniel tells us, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So the kingdom represents, of course, that ferocious beast with iron teeth, with ten horns. So when Rome imploded through all its uh, extravagance and all its arrogance, and uh, that power was not succeeded by another power, but rather it was divided into 10 nations of Europe. So the Almany became the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Sway by the Portuguese, the Visigoths, the Spanish, and then the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, which are now extinct. They were, of course, uprooted by this little horn. We're going to discover who this little horn is or was. So the 10 toes now are the 10 kings since four. 76 when the Roman Empire came to an end. So Daniel says another horn shall arise after them, right? This is another horn that arises amongst the ten kings and he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Now there's only one power that destroyed these three nations, the Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths. We will notice that it was the Emperor Zeno and the Emperor Justinian, who exterminated the last of them, the Vandals, in 534 AD. And then, of course, the Ostrogoths were broken in 538 AD. And so the three horns were plucked up from the roots. In other words, they were completely destroyed. They do not exist in Europe anymore. And so Daniel goes on to say, this little horn now would begin to speak pompous words. And even against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. So this power will now be, begin to persecute God's people. Uh, Daniel says, I was watching the same one was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. And he was making them to be what? Actually worn out. And so this is very, very important. There's a time prophecy now. The saints shall be given into his hand, into this little horn for a time, times and half a time. Now we studied this prophecy last week when we looked at uh, Revelation chapter 
12, because we see the prophecy was given in times, times and half a time, and also 42 months, which is the same time period of the persecution of this power that would come up. It's the same power. The little horn and the beast are the same power. And so, of course, when we use the day year principle, we discovered it's actually 1,260 years because a time is one year and the year was 360 days. Two times is times two, that's 720. And half of that, of course, adds up to 1,260. So 1,260 prophetic days is 1,260 literal years. And so this power, the Roman Empire, friends, it's very important to understand, the Roman Empire gave its seat, its power and authority to the Bishop of Rome, the papal power that took over from Rome. And it ruled from 5 AD, 538 to 1798. And so we find now seven definite clues. It's actually 10, but these you can really see very, very easily to identify the little horn. It comes up among the 10 European powers of Western Europe. So it can't be before that. It can't be before Rome. It's got to come after Rome. And so it comes up among the 10 Western powers. And it can't come way in the future because it comes up among the 10 powers. Number two, it will uproot three powers, three horns, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. If you just look up those two uh, those three powers, you will discover who uprooted them. It was the Bishop of Rome using the armies of uh, the Roman Empire. And it would be established after 476 AD, which is when, of course, the Iron Monarch of Rome came to an end. Now, it would become both a political and religious power. Remember, Daniel says this little horn was different to all the others. All the other powers were political. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, they were all political powers. But this power would be both a religious and a political power. I wonder what that nation is. Daniel says, I was watching and the same one was making war against the saints and rebellion against them. So he would persecute the saints. And he would also, very important here, think to change times and laws. He would meddle and fiddle with God's law. And that's why he's actually blasphemous power. And he speaks against the Most High. It says he would think to change times and laws. It has to do with God's law. And so the last one, number seven, he would persecute the saints for 1,260 years. Now, this little horn ruled from 538 AD to 1798. And friends, that is none, our, none other than the papal system of the Bishop of Rome that ruled from Rome itself, the city of Rome, in a small area called the Vatican. In fact, friends, this is history this is something that God gave us well in advance. And anyone who will just check out history will see. So we come to Revelation chapter 13 now. I had to give you that background there so we could understand it. Because we see now, when John sees this vision now, six, almost 700 years after the vision that was given to Daniel, he sees the same beast. But now they actually come up as one. Notice here, Revelation 13 here. Verse 1 and 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. Now we know what a beast is. A beast is a kingdom. A beast is a king, right? Uh, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. This is very, very important. Seven heads and ten horns. Now you'll discover the heads also represent powers. Horns also represent powers because there were seven major powers beginning with Babylon, leading up right up to before when Jesus will come. Um, and there were 10 horns, which were, of course were the lesser kingdoms of Western Europe. And so the waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so here it is now. Uh, John sees here on his horns, 10 crowns. So remember, horns are what? A king. And if you've got a crown, then you're ruling, right? So here are 10 crowns on the horns and on his heads, a blasphemous name. So this little horn, which happens to be the same beast power of Revelation 13, it is going to speak blasphemy just as it did in, Reve in Daniel chapter 7. Notice what it goes on to say here. Now the beast which I saw. Now this is a conglomerate beast now. Remember, it's one beast. It's got seven heads. And ten horns. It goes on to say here, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. So it's got the body of a leopard, right? Its feet was like the feet of a bear and its mouth like the mouth of a lion. So what is significant about this here? This power takes on 
characteristics and attributes of the powers before it. So Babylon was the head, the lion. Uh, we find, of course, the feet of the bear. That is, of course, Persia, Medo-Persia. And, of course, the leopard, which was, of course, its body now. Um, this represents Greece. So it takes on the philosophy of Greece, the religion of Babylon, and also the priesthood of Persia. And also it takes on the sun worship of Rome. So this is the power that takes on the attributes of the nations before it. And so it's very important to understand this here. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now this is very important to understand. So, so, so before this power could rise out of the sea, it would have to be given its power, throne, and great authority authority. We can discover that. So this conglomerate beast that makes up all the beasts of Daniel chapter 7 that rise up the sea, it's going to have attributes of all those powers. And so those four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, we see them come up under one beast now in Revelation chapter 13. And this is the beast that gives in the last days a mark the mark of the beast, which is still future, friends. It's still future. But, of course, the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome are in the past. But their attributes live on in this beast in Revelation chapter 13 because we discover that it takes on its forms of worship and philosophy. So the dragon gave this beast now its power, throne, and great authority. Now, you must re remember in, we looked at in Revelation chapter 12, especially in Revelation chapter 12 and verses 8, it speaks of the devil and Satan being this dragon, this great fiery dragon. But remember, the devil works through powers. The, the, the devil works through nations, through kings. And in fact, in Revelation chapter 7, it says that the beast fornicates with the kings of the world. So it's got an illicit union with the kings of the world. So behind the powers of the world, of course, is satan the red dragon but of course this power this dragon that gives this sea beast its seat and power authority of course is a ruling power which ruling power history tells us in ad 538 justinian the pagan roman empire from the roman empire officially granted the roman bishop that's the popes right the role of defender of the emperor's empire the definer of heretics and defender of the faith. Now, you need to remember that the Caesars that ruled the Roman Empire, they worshiped the sun as Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. And so they had the title called Pontifex Maximus. And so when Justinian, well, when Constantine moved his base from Rome in Italy, he moved it to Constantinople in what is today a modern day um, Turkey, right? So in Turkey, the, the country of Turkey, we find that he moved his country there and uh, his, his seat of authority there, rather. And so when he moves there to Constantinople, he named it Constantinople after his wife that was Constance. Now, what is the modern name for Constantinople? Can anyone tell me in Turkey? Anyone know the, the modern name for what's the capital of Turkey? Istanbul. So Istanbul was named Constantinople before by Constantine, the emperor of Rome. So when he moved to Istanbul, um, he changed the name of the city to Constantine. I mean, Constantinople rather. And later on, of course, it was changed to Insta Insta uh, Istanbul. <laughs> so the important thing to remember is when the, when the emperor moved now, he gave the Bishop of Rome, now Justinian, who actually conquered the last uh, Aryan power, which was the, the Heruli, um, he gave the Bishop of Rome now, the seat and the title. And the Bishop of Rome is also called Pontifex Maximus. So if you look at some of the titles of the popes, you'll see PM on the statues and some of the, um, the titles, you'll see PM, Pontifex. So they were worshipped as um, these great men gods and so it's very important to, to know that and so that's what happened there in 538 AD and so the Vatican now became the seat of power in Europe and the bishops so whoever the Pope was ruled 
And the kings of Europe, whether you were a German king, whether you were a French king, you were a Spanish king, they all bowed down to the popes. The popes had more power than the kings. And so notice what it says here. I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Now, this happened in 1798, because the popes began to rule in the year AD 538. And when the last emperor was taken off, uh, when the last uh, bishop, brother, the last pope was taken by off the, the seat of his seat of throne, uh, it was by Napoleon, who sent his general Berthier to take him off the throne. And, and so that came to an end. That was the 1,260 years the Bible said would take place. Now, notice what would happen to this power here. Now, this is speaking of something in the future now. We're coming to the future now. We, we've passed the, the, the year of 1798. It says, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. So pagan Rome was worshipped, the Caesars were worshipped as God, uh, and if you did not worship him as God, you were killed. Um, Domitian, for example, uh, he said, I am the Lord God, and if anyone didn't worship him, they were killed. And uh, he's the one that banished, by the way, um, John, the island of Patmos, to actually try to kill him in a, in a cauldron of boiling oil. So they were worshipped. That's why the title Pontifex Maximus. They were sun worshippers, and they were worshipped as the sun themselves. And so notice it says here, and they worship the dragon. So the dragon is behind this power, and the beast, and they worship the beast, saying no. So, so notice this issue here about the mark of the beast has to do with worship. And friends, in the moral law of God, there's only one commandment that has to do with worship. Now, we've studied this before in lesson number 10, but we're going to look at it very, very quickly. There's only one commandment. Now, here are the 10 commandments on the left of the screen uh, in blue given by God in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 to 17. The 10 commandments on the right-hand side um, in that purple color is as shown in the, the papal Roman system. The Catechism, and you will discover very quickly that it's got far less words. Uh, the second one has been taken out, um, and they split the last one into two to make them ten again. The second one says, Thou shalt not make unto you any graven images. So that one's gone because this power has got lots of image worship in its system. And then we find, of course, that means now the fourth commandment, which has to do with worship, is now actually the third commandment under its uh, rules. And, and so very, very clearly, the fourth commandment alone has to do with worship because God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days will you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you will not do any work. You, not your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, or your stranger or the cattle that is in the gates. For in six days, the Lord God made the heaven, the earth, the sea, the fountain, the waters, wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So here is it here. So when you look at the Roman uh, law of the papal system, that's what it looks like. It's just so short. And the fourth commandment is actually the third one. Um, in their system, which is so different, God, remember, he would think to change times and laws. And of course, they've split the 10th one into two to get the 10. And so this is the power then that would also speak blasphemies. Now in Revelation 13 verse 5, it says, and there was given unto him the beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Remember in Daniel chapter 7, it says this little horn would speak great pompous words even against the Most High. Well, here in Revelation, it says, and there was given unto him a mouth. Now, a mouth is what you declare, of course, this power through its laws also speaks great things of blasphemy. So what is blasphemy in the Bible? Now, friends, this power here, when a woman, so this is this power, a church is a woman. And the characteristics are even more spelt out in Revelation chapter 17. But, but when a woman rides a beast, we call that a union of church and state. She's different to all the other powers because she has got ecclesiastical power through its priest system, its religious laws, and its worship system. But she's also a nation that has ambassadors. And the Pope is the head, and it has its own territory. And so it's a country, a nation, but it's also a church represented by a woman. And this woman has a golden cup, which is, of course, its teachings 
that are contrary to the Bible, of course, because we studied that last week. She has made the nations drunk with the wine, Babylon, because the name is Babylon, the beast, same power. And so very important. She rides the beast. Notice what it says here in Revelation 13. that really identifies further who the beast is. I saw a woman, church, sitting on a scarlet beast nation, which was full of names of blasphemy. So what is blasphemy in the Bible? Revelation 13 verse 5 goes and say, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. So this 42 months in Revelation 12, 13, sorry, this 42 months in Revelation 13 is the same time, times and half a time in Revelation chapter 12, when she would persecute the woman. Um, and also 42 months is the same power. And of course, in Daniel chapter 7, she would continue for times and the dividing of time which is the same time. So this is the year, of course, from AD 538, when the bishops of Rome began to rule up to 1798, when Pope Pius VI was uh, taken off his throne and imprisoned and died in captivity. And so she persecuted God's people during this 1,002 uh, and this 1,260 years. And so in the great Colosseums, many people were killed and destroyed there, right? Um, just because you believed in God. And so this was a terrible time, more than 50 million. Historians tell us anywhere between 50 million and 100 million Christians were slaughtered just for believing anything other than what Rome taught. This is a historical fact. It happened. And so what is blasphemy in the Bible? John 10 verse 33. Now the Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy. And this is what they said to Jesus. For a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. So that is one of the definitions. When you claim to make yourself God, it is blasphemy. Now, do the bishops of Rome claim to be God? Yes, they do. All of them do. But here's some glaring examples here. Um, Pope Leo XIII said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. And they were to be worshipped as Pontifex Maximus, they, which means bridge builders. They claim to be the bridge between heaven and earth. And so they wear a, a mitre or a crown with three tiers because they claim to be head over earth, heaven, and the underworld or the dead. And so they also claim to forgive sins. Notice this is very, very recent. Pope Francis has granted all Roman Catholic priests the power to forgive the grave sin of abortion. So they have power to forgive sins. And so you go to the confessional and you confess to another man who himself is a sinner. Now, the Bible says that is blasphemy. Notice here what it says here in Mark 2 verse 7. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So Jesus had just forgiven someone their sin. And, and, and he was accused by the priests of blasphemy because they said, you are just a man. How can you forgive sins? Only God can forgive. So, so when, when the Pope says they have power and the priests have power to forgive sins, that is blasphemy because they themselves are sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and sh fallen short of the glory of God. None are righteous, not even one. So friends, this is it here. Um, blasphemy is when you claim to be God. And when you claim to forgive sins. Now, notice here, it was granted to him, the beast now, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So the deadly wound will heal after 1790. It's still future. And she, this power will begin again to persecute. So notice what's going to happen here. It says here, he, this is the beast, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this power would raise up an image. And this is a study of a power that would collaborate with the papal Roman system to enforce a death decree for those who would not worship the beast or receive his mark. It happened before in history. In Daniel chapter 3, we read of three Hebrew boys. Their names are Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Those are the Hebrew names. We better know them as the Babylonian names, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Well, they were thrown in a burning, fiery furnace because they would not bow down to the image of the beast set up by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar also claimed to be uh, a priest, and he was worshipped as the great sun god. Uh, the great god was Bel-Maduk in the Babylonian system. 
the sun god. In Egypt, it was Ra, and they worshipped Ra as the great sun god. In uh, Persia, it was Mitra, and in um, Greece, it was Helios, same power, same uh, god. And then, of course, the Roman soul invictus, the invincible sun. And so it's the same power. They were sun worshippers. And so this power will do something. It will cause everyone, small, great, rich, poor, free, slave, to do what? To receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no one may buy or sell. This is still future. God is giving us all this prophecy to tell us this time is coming when the papal Roman system's deadly wound will be healed and through its collaboration with the land beast of Revelation 13, the two-horned lamb beast that will speak like a dragon, it will come together and enforce a mark, which is a religious mark, and you will not be able to buy or sell, so there'll be an economic blockade, and in fact, you'll be killed. There'll be a death decree if you do not follow. It says, except anyone who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the beast. So now it's getting a little bit more detailed. The name of the beast is character. So if you take on the character of this power, you will receive the mark. If you have the number of his name, we're going to work that out just now. Who has the number of the beast? And so very clearly, it enforces the mark in two places. The forehead where we make a decision or the hands. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, whatsoever your hand does, um, not verse 5, it's somewhere in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, whatever your hand does, do it with all your might because there's no device in the grave anymore. I think it's in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. Or it's Ecclesiastes 9 verses 7. So the hand is symbolic of what you do. The mind is symbolic of what you think. So there will be people who will accept its religious authority and, and go along with it. And there are others who will say, listen, I don't accept it, but because I don't want to have this economic blockade where I can't buy or sell, I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be killed. So I'm just going to go along by my works. In other words, your hand. And so it will enforce worship. Now, God only accepts true worship from the heart by our choice. And so the seal of God is placed in the forehead, only in the mind. And so friends, very clearly here, it says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. I want you to understand something. Six is the number of man. In fact, 666 actually came from the Babylonian system. Um, they were, Nebuchadnezzar, ne Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 3 was six cubits wide and 66 cubits high, 60 cubits high, sorry. So when you, six times 60 is 360. And of course, the sun is 360 degrees and they worship the sun. And so that number six is the number of a man. And of course, man was actually made on the sixth day, remember, in the Garden of Eden. And of course, God's number is seven because God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Seven is the number of perfection in Bible prophecy. Six is the number of men. But this num this power has got six, six, six. And so it is a system. I want you to understand that is the system of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, before anyone goes at me, God is never against people. God loves the Roman Catholics. God loves Buddhists. God loves Muslims. God loves every nation on earth. That's why these messages are sent out to every nation. So God is never against the good, wonderful, Christian, Catholic people. What God is against is the teachings of this power. Not, God is not even against the Pope himself. Because the man is the Pope who rules at a specific time. So the, the Antichrist or the beast is not a particular pope. It's anyone who is in that seat of authority because they claim the same title, Pontifex Maximus, the bridge builder, and they claim the same prerogatives as men to be worshipped as God. Uh, they may not say it so, so much these days, but if you go into the writings, they claim to be gods on earth. And so here's the number on the pope's mitre, right? That's that crown that he wears. Not all of them have it. But if you go into the history, they, they will even tell you that the Pope's title is Vicarious Philidae. It means the vicar of the Son of God. If you add up the Roman numerals, remember this 
is a Roman power. So you're going to use the numerals of the Roman system. If you add up the numbers, V is five, I is one, C is 100, A is, there's no uh, uh, value, R there's no value, uh, I is one again, V is five, that's 112, if no value, one, in, that's in the Roman numeral system, uh, one, uh, I is one, L is 50, and then that's 53, and again, D is now 500, E has got no value, I is one, 501, you add those all up in, in Roman numerals, 666. Six, six. And so the system itself, I want you to understand that the power that rules, the man who rules is following the system that has been put up. It's an image to the beast. It is the mark of the beast. And so it is its organizational structure, not the people. God is never against the good people that are there. And so here's nine points quickly that identify the beast and what they are. We're going to go through this very quickly. He receives power, seat, and authority from the dragon. That is, of course, the dragon power, which was the Roman Empire. When Justinian gave his seat and power and authority to the Bishop of Rome in 538 AD. It comes up after the pagan Roman Empire. Pagan Roman Empire fell in 476 AD. Becomes a worldwide power. It's going to have power to be able to enforce this law all over the world. That's still future. Right, according to Revelation 3, verse 17. Of course, it had that power during the 1260 years. It'll begin to exercise that power again when the deadly wound is healed. It rules for 42 prophetic months, which is the same as 1260 ellipsal years. And he is guilty of blasphemy, right? Claiming to be God, claiming to forgive sins. He received a deadly wound, which happened in 1798 when he lost his seat and power, but it was given back. It, was, it, it will be given back completely. So the, the wound has been partially healed in 1929 when Mussolini gave the papal states back its power. But that's a partial healing. The full healing will take place when it begins to persecute again and use its power in religious and political affairs worldwide. So it persecutes God's saints, Revelation 13 verse 7. It has a mystical number 666. And so the papacy, friends, the Roman Catholic papacy is the only power that fits all the marks. You might find one or two, three can fit some powers like Stalin or Mussolini or someone else, but not all of them, especially when it arose out of the 10 kingdoms, the year is time for persecution. When you take the time prophecies, only one power fits. So if we have the message then now, who this power is, we're going to find out what the mark is. So who give the message of warning in Revelation? Very clearly here, Revelation 3 verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So God gives the warnings. I want you to understand that. And God loves everyone, including the popes and including the bishops and the cardinals and the members of that system, because God has people there that he's going to call out into fellowship, into one great body of Christ. But he calls them out of false worship, out of breaking God's commandments. And so I want you to understand because some of us have family that are part of the system, right? And God loves them. And so God is never against the good people there. God is against the organizational structure, against the teachings and the laws of the Roman papal system. There are many wonderful people in that uh, uh, communion of faith. And so I want you to understand that uh, many, many, many a priest has, has come out of Rome and accepted Christianity because, friends, that power actually goes against many of God's laws. Throws out the second commandment, modifies the fourth commandment, modifies the tenth commandment, claims to forgive sins, claims to be man of God, changes baptism to sprinkling from immersion, baptizing babies through sprinkling. And then you've got the adoration and worship of saints, uh, the worship of the dead. All these teachings, the wine of Babylon, God is against the teaching, but never, never against the people. So he calls people into true worship. So what is the mark of the beast? We have discovered what the beast is. It is the Roman Catholic papal system, and it is the one who is ruling, not any specific one. So right now it's Pope Francis, but God loves Pope Francis. And if Pope Francis will accept the Bible and Jesus as the Lord and not claim to be God himself, then he will be saved. So we have identified who the beast is. Let's ask the beast what is marked. So, so very clearly, 
the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. In other words, when we have determined through biblical prophecy and through history who the beast is, then the beast will tell us what his or her mark is because it's a church system. So here it comes straight from the horse's mouth. This is the Catholic record, and it's recent, as you can see there. And you can look this up yourselves. September the 1st, 1923. What does it say? Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath, seventh-day Sabbath, observance is proof of that fact. It's going to tell us very clearly, very plainly. So, so here is something that they say very boldly. They are not trying to hide it. They are just stating a fact because in Roman Catholic theology tradition, the councils of the popes and the bishops and the cardinals is equivalent and even above the Bible. Notice what they say. The church is above the Bible. Well, we study the Bible because we want to know God's word. And if it's in the Bible, it's for me. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me. How many of you share that idea? So I want you to know that Sunday sacredness is from the Roman papal system. That's where it came from. And it started in the year AD 326 when Sylvester, the Bishop of Rome, declared it to be a religious holiday. And prior to that in AD 321, Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, declared it to be a holiday in honor of the venerable day of the sun. There were sun worshipers. And so I want you to understand that. I want you to understand it very clearly. Sunday is not in scripture. And we've studied that before. Is there any other proof of change the papacy made? So this is the, like the clearest proof. If you are a Catholic or if you've been a Catholic like, like my wife was, you had to go through what is called the convert's catechism of Catholic doctrine. So it's something that you had to accept to become a Catholic. So this is kind of like, you know, very, very essential. It's like non-negotiable. You have to adhere to this doctrine. So it's written in a question and answer form. And I've got actually a copy uh, that is in my own possession. So I'm just quoting from just one section here. Now, when it comes to the fourth commandment, they ask the question and they're gonna give us the answer. Which is the Sabbath day? They give you the answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. They ask another question. Why do we, Catholics observe Sunday instead of Sabbath. I can give you the answer. Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity, which means the um, holiness or sanctity, from Saturday the seventh day to Sunday the first day. Now they go on to say, question, how do you prove that the church had power to command feast and holy days? Ah, they give you the answer. By the very act of changing the Sabbath, fourth commandment, into Sunday, which Protestants allow us. So they're saying, listen, the Protestants that also keep Sunday, whether you're Presbyterian or Baptist or whatever, if you are keeping Sunday, they say, listen, we changed it. Now they tell us, and therefore they, Protestants, fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. Question, have you any other way of proving that the church Roman Catholic Church has power to institute festivals and precept its laws? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week. A change. Notice what they say. A change for which there's no scriptural authority. So they clearly admit, we changed the day. We did it way back there, AD 326, because prior to that, the apostles, Jesus and the apostles, right up to John who writes the book of Revelation, they all kept Sabbath, seventh day, Saturday as a holy day to not only worship God, but to keep holy as a day. Now, Rome says it's the mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority. Ecclesiastical just means ecclesia, which is the priesthood. Uh, by the way, uh, the priesthood is actually was was came to an end when Jesus died on the cross. Uh, you know, a priest offers a sacrifice, and that's why in a cathedral you have an altar because the mass is where they sacrifice every day 
the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ in the wafer and the fermented wine that they get. And that's called transubstantiation. And so they claim to have this power even to make God into a creature. The Bible says God died once for us. Jesus died once for all. And so, friends, notice what they say very, very boldly here. And you can look this up. It's called Rome's Challenge. And it's in December 2003 that it was um, actually put on www.immaculateheart.com uh, slash Mary online. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests. <laughs> they are protesting now that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath Saturday to Sunday and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. This is what Rome says. So this, is, this is serious. And this is about authority. It's not about days. You see, God is the authority when it comes to giving the law. And he's given his law, the Sabbath, in the fourth commandment on the seventh day. And he made it holy in honor of the creation of earth. And of course, when Jesus died, he rests in the tomb on Sabbath. It also becomes in honor of his what? He's saving us, which is redemption. So creation and redemption. And so this is very, very clear. Notice, friends, the Catholic world, page eight or nine. Now, this is what they say. The sun is you in, in the sky, was a foremost God with hidden them, right? So from the pyramids, from Babylon, from the Medes and the Persians, from the Greeks, from the Romans. Sun was a foremost God within them. There is in truth something royal kingly about the sun, making a fit emblem of Jesus the Son. Now God never wants us to worship him through images. He doesn't want us to worship him through something that he has made. God wants to worship him in spirit and truth through Jesus Christ, his son only. Hence the church, the Roman church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, Sunday, it shall remain consecrated and sanctified. And thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder, that is Baal, sun worship, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. And if you go to Rome, and I, as I have been, I took this picture here from the top of the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. That is a sun wheel. This is the biggest sun wheel in the world. It's got eight spokes on it, and there is an oblux. An oblux was something used for sun worship in Egypt. That oblux was taken from Egypt there. It points upward into the air as a sun. It's also got fertility worship, which is so, so licentious. I can't even talk about that. And these are images all here. These are saints. And so this is what the system is built on. Now, did the papacy really change God's fourth commandment? Well, the Bible says he would think to change times and laws. If he could change it, he's going to take God off his throne and say, okay, I'm going to do away with you and I'm going to now change the law. Because a country that overturns another country's law has to first conquer that country before they can do it. Notice what Jesus said. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy or to fulfill. What concern did God have in Ezekiel's day? Now, there was something happening in Ezekiel's day. They were actually worshiping the sun in the temple which is called an abomination. You can read it in Ezekiel chapter 8. But here is something that the priests were doing. Notice in Ezekiel 22 verse 26. A priest have violated my law and profaned my holy things. The Sabbath is holy. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. So this is what the priests of Rome have done. What did God say about attempts to change his law? Jesus again says, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. In other words, God's law is binding. What does God command his angels to hold? Why, sorry, does God command his angels to hold earth's final destruction? The reason is God wants to save us. He wants to save you and me. And he's got people in this Roman Catholic system that he's calling to come out. In Revelation 18 verses 1, it says, come out of a my people, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our gods on their forehead. And so God wants to seal us. The mark of the beast is in opposition to the seal of God. So in other words, God's seal and sign is the seventh-day Sabbath. And that's why the beast has brought about his sign, his mark, which is, of course, Sunday worship. So the third angel follows them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worship the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand... 
He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, seven last plagues, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation, and the smoke of the torment ascends forever and forever. Notice this here. And they have no rest day or night to worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. The name is character. And so, friends, I want you to know something very, very serious here. This is the most solemn warning in all of Scripture. God is saying in the last days, he wants people who will worship him in truth, in spirit and in truth. Babylon, the beast, the Antichrist power, is teaching people to worship on Sunday to keep a day holy that God has not blessed. And friends, it's a question about authorities, not just a question of days. Where is the beast mark placed on people? Well, it's placed on their right hand or on the foreheads, and no one will be able to buy or sell. And so those who don't accept the Sunday, when it is declared to be a day of worship for the world, it will, its future, and with it will come the death decree, then only does it become the mark of the beast. Right now, those who worship on Sunday don't have the mark of the beast. I want to make that very, very clear. So do people now observe Sunday uh, have the mark? That's the question I've asked. No, it'll only happen when the death decree comes and when the mark is enforced with a no buy and no sell. It was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause through its laws as many as would not worship the image of the beast. And so it will be placed on their foreheads. And so 666, which, friends, is the number of the beast. That's not the mark of the beast. It's the number of the beast. But that beast is going to impose the mark, which is Sunday worship. It's coming. It's not yet. It's in the future. But God has got a sign. God has got a seal. It is his holy Sabbath, which is the seventh day. And so John 15, verse 22, Jesus is telling to those of you that don't know, he's saying, now that I've told you, only now is it sin. In fact, it says here, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have not had sin. But now that they have no excuse for this sin. It also in Acts chapter 17, verses 32 or 31, it says, uh, at, at the time of this ignorance, God says, I will wink at it. But now he commands men everywhere to repent. How does God decide whom we serve? Very important. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. What happens if I'm neutral? Some people will say, well, I don't want to get involved. I'm not uh, accepting Catholic doctrine or neither am I going to accept the mark. Well, notice what it says here. Jesus says this, he who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. In other words, everyone is going to have to make a decision one way or another. What did Christ's disciples say when facing a test? This is what they said. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. In other words, will you obey God's commandments or will you obey the doctrines, the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church? If you do, it says in vain, they worship me teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. Well, how can I make sure I will not receive the mark? How many of you think it's a good question? That's a very good question. Here's how we can make sure. Here is the patience or the endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you want to follow Jesus and you want to obey all his commandments. Well, God's last warning in Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12, the three angels' messages warns us that the hour of the judgment has come. And it says, worship him who made the heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. And so this is a direct quote from the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and verses 11. So it's got to do with true worship, which is the Sabbath, false worship, which is Sunday. If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, the same will also drink of the wine of the wrath. So friends, we've got two choices. We're either going to worship the creator. His sign and seal is when we observe the seven day Sabbath, according to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, or we will land up worshiping the beast. If we don't worship the creator, there's no question about it. We will be deceived by the miracles of the beast and by his power and great authority. And so that's what it's all about. The mark of the beast has got to do with worship. We're either going to accept God's seal, Sabbath, or we're going to accept the mark of the beast when it's enforced. 666, mark of the beast is rebellion. And of course, God's Sabbath is about truth. So Matthew 25, verse 41, as we're coming to a close. Hellfire, we're going to start with next week, is for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want anyone, but those who are going to have the mark of the beast will actually going to be 
destroyed by the fires of hell. That's a sobering thought. Think about it. God wants you and I to come into truth. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But when you come, you will have right to enter into the city. And so that's our study for today. I pray that you were blessed. And um, I'd like to hear your comments. Uh, send me a text. Uh, call me. I'd love to hear from you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the solemn subject that we've studied tonight. We've actually studied two studies in one setting. Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13, which are twin chapters. But we see clearly that the mark of the beast has to do with worship, and it is a false system of worship. And Lord, you have many of your people in that system. And we praise you and thank you that you are calling men and women into your truth. I pray if there's anyone here who has not made a decision for you, that you will lead them to stand on the side of truth. Bless them with your spirit and keep us faithful to you until you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.